plenary of the Global Landscapes Forum, this biodiversity conference, transformational change. What does that mean? A call for collective action, for global action. This is going to be a very exciting session with great speakers, really looking forward to the future and presenting why we should be having this transformational change at this juncture in human history. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Elizabeth Murema, who is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Musonda, for your kind introduction and invitation. Thank you again to the Global Landscapes Forum and all of you who are joining us uh, today. I'm sincerely honored to speak to you at this closing session of this momentous, uh, momentous Global Landscape Forum Digital Conference on Biodiversity. The last two days have allowed us to learn more about the about devastating effects of biodiversity loss and of climate change and how they are inextricably connected. We are living out of balance with nature. We are feeling the repercussions, including the current global pandemic that has caused so much suffering. The projected continued decline in biodiversity will affect us all but it will also have a particularly detrimental effect on those that depend on it most. Indigenous peoples, the local communities, the world's poor and the most vulnerable. I've been heartened by the stories, the presentation of projects and programs, the innovations, the truly excellent caliber of the discussions held in this forum. These outputs will be a source of information and inspiration to the continuing process of developing the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which will guide the implementation of conservation, sustainable use, and equitably sharing the benefits of biodiversity for the next decade. I would like to also call your attention to the presence of many focal points to the Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols and their representatives whose participation in the last two days have been enabled through the generosity of the organizers. And by the way, today the Nagoya Protocol on Access Benefit Sharing is celebrating its 10th birthday since the day it was adopted a decade ago. On their behalf and all uh, our focal points behalf, I thank the organizers for providing this opportunity for them to participate in these discussions. It is truly through making these linkages between policy and science that we will make the transformative changes that are required. I hope at this forum, we have seen this in practice. And so what is truly needed for transformative change? We will hear much more on this from the distinguished panelists in this session. The fifth Global Biodiversity Outlook, which examined the progress made towards achieving the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, look to the future and examine the promises, progress and prospects for eight interdependent transitions on key issues that collectively can move our societies into a more sustainable coexistence with nature. These eight interlinked transitions provide insights for actions under land and forest, fisheries and oceans, sustainable agriculture, fresh water, climate action, food systems, cities and infrastructure, and building on these all one health. Bold interdependent actions are needed for these transitions to become a reality. This includes great, greatly stepping up efforts to conserve and restore biodiversity, 
addressing climate change in ways that limit global temperature rise without imposing unintended consequences or additional pressures on biodiversity and transforming the way in which we produce, consume and trade goods and services, and most particularly food that rely on and have an impact on biodiversity. I've been inspired by the discussions, the expertise, the enthusiasm for change at this forum. I would like to conclude by saying, by giving this inspiration back to you all and with a call to action, it is not too late to slow, halt, and eventually reverse the current trends in the decline of biodiversity and the harmful effects of climate change. It is not too late to heal the planet. We have transformative pathways before us. We must begin working on these pathways. I thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your wisdom, for your amazing and generous words in terms of calling the world to action and why we need to act to slow, halt or stop the degradation that we as mankind have vested onto this planet. In this next session, I have three amazing speakers to really talk about the global context, looking at how we can explore and perhaps understanding from the different institutions how we can be engaged as part of this transformational change. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Cristiane Paulos, who's coming as Director General from the Nature, Conservation and Sustainable Use of Natural Resources at the Federal Minister of Environment, the German Federal Minister of Environment, um, based in the Environment, Nature and Conservation Nuclear Safety, BMU, Germany. Dr. Paulos, welcome, if you're there. Thank it's, you. It's such an honor to have you here on this panel. So we're very curious. Germany has been instrumental in supporting the FR100 Initiative 2020 Bond Challenge. So what is Germany's view around the issue of ecosystem restoration as a key nature-based solution to achieving Agenda 2030? Yeah, hello everybody and uh, to uh, good evening from Germany to the participants of the GLF conference. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the inv invitation and uh, for the honor to speak to you uh, today and uh, hello also to my co-panelists. Yeah, um, you have been asking me why we are supporting all these restoration initiatives and um, I would uh, start uh, to step one uh, step back and that is before we uh, talk about the restoration of ecosystems, we must not forget the conservation aspect. So for me, it is very important and clear that conservation uh, is always the first um, to protect nature and uh, it must go hand in hand with the, the restoration of ecosystems. And once a virgin forest is lost, it is lost, lost forever. It cannot be restored. Um, and that must always be considered first. But apart from that, um, uh, we think that ecosystem restoration is important for two reasons. First is that uh, well-functioning ecosystems have a direct benefit. They are uh, important habitats, indispensable carbon sinks, and they provide irreplaceable livelihoods for local bio-based economies. And we have heard a lot of stories about that and the importance for people, um, the benefit that, uh, that the ecosystems uh, provide. And secondly, um, the process of uh, restoration sends the urgently needed positive signal that after decades of over exploiting our ecosystems, we can reverse this trend with nature based solutions. And um, people are saddened by biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, while they are um, in that mood, um, the restoration of ecosystem can not only provide economic benefits, but also a vision that goes beyond individual disciplines, borders and interest. And that is the message is we can restore our future. And uh, 
especially at the moment, we need this positive message to trigger the necessary transformational change to successfully implement the 2030 agenda. And that is um, the main, one of the main reasons that why my ministry supports initiatives like the Bond Challenge, ELF, and the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Now that is really, really amazing. And I'm so grateful that you've really highlighted the need for this also positive outlook and to give some hope to make sure that we're also hopeful around the work that we do. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed out is very much in line with what the actual UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration Resolution says. It starts with the word conservation before it talks about restoration, um, which is actually very important. Thank you very much for those wise words. The next speaker is Ms. Carla Montensi, who is the Director for the Planet and Prosperity in DG DEFCO in the European, Commu in the European Commission. Carla, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Are you hearing me? Fantastic. Yes, okay. yes I can hear you very, very well. So, Dr. Muzunda, very, brilliant. very I'm happy. so glad. Me very, too. Yes. Very happy so, to join. Uh, this... Say, over to you. I'm glad. Yes. So the European Commission has been a prominent player in relation to biodiversity agenda and has developed, you know, a suite of seminal policy documents, the Green Deal, Farm to Fork, among many others. So how would these, you know, be ambitions to be implemented in this sort of bigger political agenda and the political traction around this One Health approach, which has been the theme of this particular GLF and going beyond the EU borders? Yes, absolutely. Many, many thanks to you and I'm very happy to join this closing session. And I think just let me start by saying that as all the debates during the forum must demonstrate, I think it's clear for us, for all of us, that deep change are needed. And let me say from the beginning that the European Union is fully engaged in contributing to these changes, in contributing to implement a transformative agenda. You mentioned already, we have adopted at the level of the European Union, the Green Deal. What is this? Just a new growth model. Uh, it's our plan for a real recovery and a transformation that wants to ensure the long-term sustainability. Now, when we look to this Green Deal, uh, there are uh, several strategies that uh, back this uh, European Green Deal in key areas. And if we look to two of this era, just let me speak about biodiversity and the farm to fork strategy. And when we look to the European Union biodiversity strategy, we have adopted a clear roadmap of action inside the European Union and outside the European Union, and a strong commitment to integrate biodiversity in all our bilateral or multilateral engagement. When we look to the farm to fork strategy, what is about is two words is how we can accelerate our transition to a sustainable food system that should have a neutral or a positive environment impact that should help to mitigate the climate change and should help to adapt to its impact reverse the losses of biodiversity and assure of food security, nutrition and the public health. So when we look to this two strand of our Green Deal, it's clear that this Green Deal is, is a, the European Union response to the COVID pandemic is the blueprint of our external cooperation because we want to support the green recovery model. We want to support the building back better using our external cooperation with our partner countries. So the approach that we are proposing, because you mentioned how really to implement the proposal, uh, the model that we are proposing is just to uh, uh, face the planetary emergency using an integrated approach. So biodiversity and the farm to fork strategy are the 
the model, how the way in which we want to be green, we want to be inclusive, and the thesis fit perfectly with the one health uh, approach. So the idea is clear on biodiversity, addressing environment degradation, wildlife tracking, illegal trade, the unsustainable use of biodiversity, just to prevent or contain the, the zoonotic disease. And one way of supporting the One Health approach is clearly, in our view, to insist on the economic and the social relevance of restoring our relationship with nature. If we succeed to what it was called the, the, the mutual benefit to demonstrate how working in nature will really support the economic and, and the social issue, we uh, can successfully in delivering the, the, the One Health approach. So introducing biodiversity in mainstreaming way in everything that we will, we will do. For the farm to fork strategy, it's really the same. So we will seek to promote more sustainable form of agriculture based on agricultural principle, uh, of course, on the basis of the latest validated science. This will clearly help to ensure neutral and the positive impact on ecosystem and reduce the pressure on world life. So if we succeed to have Alfer agro, agro system, we are sure that this will lead to alpha population and they are more resilient to shock and, and the crisis. So really ensuring more sustainability in value chain, in food system, ensuring setting ambitious standards to food quality, all these key elements will be the answer in implementing an one health approach. And this will be translated clearly, of course, into specific capacity building for both animal and the human health uh, community. So an integrated approach to achieve the one health uh, uh, approach. Um, very concretely, this means that we have to avoid uh, silo approaches and clearly we want to work to assure that our expert, our partner from different areas, from different expertise, work together and develop this uh, integrated strategy. So we are clearly decided to move ahead and to count, of course, on our partners to build ambitious cooperation, ambitious partnership to achieve this one health approach within Europe and beyond the European borders. And we are really engaged to work on this into all the multilateral debate that was just reminded by, by the previous speaker. Many thanks and over to you. Thank you very much, Carla. Really, really absolute wise words. How we do, we do need to move away from silos uh, that have not been necessary and functional for our very existence and for the very work that the EU is very much engaged in. I'm so glad that you mentioned the issue of sustainable food systems because this has really come up and I think something that's so indicative with this pandemic. Unhealthy systems also makes us more susceptible and not you know, resilient when we have such shocks in the system and within our human system. So it's great to see this transformational agenda, especially around the Green Deal. Well done, thank you so very much for that. Thank you very much for your wisdom. Thank you. At this juncture, I'd like to move over to Carlos Manuel and just really welcome you and congratulate you, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, for your role, your new role as the CEO of the Global Environment Facility. Um, it's been wonderful to, to reconnect again here a bit virtually. Um, now, focusing on the work that you're doing as the new CEO, you'll obviously be building on a vast body of achievements from the previous Jeff Cycles. How do you see the power of the green environment, the, the, the global environment facility and how it can be used, especially within the context of this conversation around transformational change, to make sure that we have systemic transformation that is needed for a healthy planet? Well, thank you, Musunda, for, for that and pleasure to share this panel uh, with uh, Christiane and, and Carla. And, and uh, let me begin by 
by joining uh, uh, joining me with uh, Elisabetta Morena uh, on celebrating the 10th uh, anniversary of our very landmark uh, the decision on, on the Nagoya protocol for benefit, uh, for access and benefit sharing is a landmark decision. We need to really uh, advance our efforts in implementing that and, and the GF is, is a key actor in supporting countries in the full implementation of the Nagoya protocol. So extremely happy that uh, we are where we are with the Nagoya protocol and I, and I hope that we can keep on being very ambitious, uh, particularly in the un, uh, incoming uh, post-2020 framework for, for the CBD. And, um, um, you know, the CBD, as well as the DGF, are very close uh, to have their 30th uh, birthday. Very soon, we'll turn 30 years old. Wow. And if we go, yeah, and, and in these last 30 years, you know, we've done a great things uh, at the planet level, particularly in terms of human development. If we see what humans has done in, in terms of human development, we are, we need to really feel satisfied by the fact that we had healthier and more educated people. We have uh, improved uh, governance. We have improved uh, transparency and accountability from governments. I mean, any single human development index has improved dramatically. Uh, there's still a lot to be done. Of course, this, this, this is, you know, in the context of the pre-COVID-19 situation and the COVID uh, uh, is uh, sending us a lot of messages. And, and one of the messages that I think is extremely important is that even though we have done a lot of progress in terms of human development, we're still very resilient. And we are vulnerable and not resilient enough to global events. And if, um, this is what is happening today uh, uh, with a pandemic. Um, I can only imagine, you know, what uh, it can be for us uh, uh, with this um, biodiversity collapse and, and climate change. Nevertheless, in terms of human development, we have done great. And in terms of implementing the, the decisions of the CBD and in terms of what the GF has done, even though we can say we, we, we have done great, uh, we have lost forests, wildlife, uh, like never before in these like, last uh, 30 years. We are in track of having more plastic than fish in the ocean. Uh, the atmosphere, the soil, and the water uh, totally polluted. So here's a paradigm. We have been able to achieve a lot of progress in these last three, uh, three decades in terms of human development. Nevertheless, we haven't done much progress at the same rate and same scale, scale in terms of managing our natural capital. And that means that um, the, the advances in, human, in, in, in our human resource and human development is totally unsustainable because nature is going to pass us an invoice that will uh, put in jeopardy that human development. And, and, and the pandemic is, is the best uh, example of how fragile, uh, fragile we are. So we need to really concentrate and in, in, in narrow down the gap in terms of human development and the management of our natural capital. And, and the GF is an organization that is very well situated. Nevertheless, and this is very important, nevertheless, even though, even though the GF is the largest financial mechanism for nature conservation, you know, it only managed 1% of the global finance for nature conservation. And that is a reality. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of challenges ahead of all and, uh, and definitely uh, restoration, landscape restoration, ecosystem restoration is a key element. And um, I come from a country, Costa Rica, who used to be in the 1970s, the world champion of deforestation per capita. And in a matter of three decades, went from being the, the, the world champion in deforestation per capita to being the world champion in restoration per capita. We went from one stream to the other. Costa Rica in the last uh, 30 years, and, and in part because of the bilateral and multilateral support, like GF and many bilateral, was able to really understand how do we go from a high deforestation, low yields in the, seed, uh, in the food system into a new paradigm where nature can be restored and at the same time, the economy can grow in the same process by which we double the size of our forests, our economy triple. So three things here 
and, and Christian and, and Carla mentioned them. And, and I can give faith uh, uh, of uh, the good uh, outcomes of doing that. Three reasons were the ones behind Costa Rica being able to restore uh, forests, to stop deforestation, um, to create a good sound business of, uh, uh, of using sustainably uh, um, biodiversity. And the three elements are one, even though Costa Rica was a very poor nature, nature it, it understood very well that the, the foreign financial aid should be a catalyzer for the mobilization of domestic resources. So as Costa Rica was being supported by the GF and the Germans and the EU and the Americans, Costa Rica understood that that was an investment that should catalyze mechan local mechanisms by which uh, we should mobilize resources. A good example is the carbon tax that we put in the 1990s. The carbon tax is being used, the revenues of the carbon tax is being used to pay people to restore the landscape. So if you pay them the cost of opportunity of doing cattle ranching, people will bring both back forests and protect them. The other element was we went from negative and perverse incentives in, into positive ones. This is Aichi target number three. One of the biggest failures, according to GBO5, is that we didn't we did not did any progress on Aichi target number three, which is basically going from perverse incentives into positive one. Today, we globally human invest many, many more times in activities that destroy nature than what we invest in protecting nature. And there was a, a recent report this week telling us that the, uh, the real story behind the banking sector, that the bank sector, uh, globally speaking, invests um, 400 times more resources in activities that destroy nature than what we all together invest in nature conservation. That was the second element. And the third element uh, is dealing with the political silos, political incoherence, and the wrong institutional framework. If we wanna do a good advance in restoring landscapes and managing landscapes and seascapes in a sustainable manner, we need to redesign the institutional framework in the public sector by which we can break with silos. And the good example is we divide, we divide agencies within agencies that manage renewable and non-renewable natural resources. You know, typical case, ministries of environment, and then on the other side, ministries of energy and mining with different visions. They, they clash, they don't collaborate, they don't complement, and they confront themselves with different policies in the same landscapes, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we got a big problem in terms of you know losing nature and contributing to climate change. Costa Rica began redesigning their institutional framework until we found a system or or, or a scheme that responds to the need of integrated uh, landscapes. So we we designed this uh, institutional framework, landscape framework, and I think that that is very important. These are key elements that the GF uh, uh, is working uh, in, in lieu of the incoming replenishment. So if, if we only have one, if we are only uh, available to mobilize and invest 1% of the global finance for nature conservation, we need to be more smart, strategic and savvy on how do we trigger process, political process that will give us more policy coherence, which will give us an expectation of higher impacts at the country level. Well, thank you for, for the invitation. I was really moved by, by the many presentations uh, during this forum. I was very moved by the presentation of my fellow friend from Nicaragua about the very challenging, um, um, uh, very big challenging uh, uh, situations that they do have uh, uh, from the uh, small communities in these large uh, landscapes where policy coherence is a needed element that we need to put in the front line of our efforts for sustainability. Thank you, Musunda. Muchos gracias, Carlos Manuel. That is really amazing. Thank you so much for your voices, all three of you. And really, you just hit the nail on the head. We have to be smart, strategic, and savvy. And we really have to you know, move on very swiftly and ahead. Thank you very much to all three of you for this session. And I'm going to move on to just a wonderful little break with an amazing woman who's going to give us a poem. And we're very much looking forward to listening to Oka. Oka, if you're there, share your poem. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can have your video. Um, I'm trying to turn my video on. Let me see if 
think uh hmm i'm not sure why my video isn't showing to be honest i do apologize but if it's all right with you i think i'll just begin go ahead okay great thank you all so much um this is a poem i wrote entitled in which i hypnotize a tiger in my forthcoming book ultimatum orangutan and I'd like to dedicate this to the cause of indigenous sovereignty over indigenous lands, in which I hypnotize a tiger, not made for Byron quotes and Tinder profiles, not squandered for bullets slung as attempts at gumption, not slit with knives on colonist orders then strung up, not sold to a venture capitalist who'll pays, place her pale feet and heels and on you, not vanishing, not a chipmunk cheeked emoji, not bedtime threat to children in cold climates, not CGI recreation with an underappreciated actor voicing you, not a bevy of ill-advised tattoos, not the hangover, not sports team embodiment, not go get em, not taxidermy, not species forgotten, not a name used for foreplay, not a fantastic form of balm for soothing creaking muscle tissue, not a totem for my calming alone, not tired and misunderstood and hiding and rotting and gone. Scream without shame or fear of banishment. This is no forest of wounding, tribulation, dust of your bone. Lick your paws, open your eyes. Thank you very much. Oh, that was so beautiful, Oka. Thank you so very much. Absolutely enjoyed it. Thank you very much for sharing your soul and, and your beautiful poem. Very quickly, I'm going to now introduce the next segment where we have some principal speakers. And we're going to go to a beautiful landscape that I absolutely love and enjoyed working in and going around and meeting amazing people. I'm going to invite Mwembu, um, if you can just come forward and we would love to hear about your work that you do as a founder of Caracol in Mount Elgon in Uganda. So we, we want to find out from you your sense of urgency around this transformation that needs to happen and what would that require and what does the future look like for you? Thank you very much. And thank you to the Global Landscape Forum for inviting us and the farmers from Bugisu in Eastern Uganda and for giving us a stage to share what we're doing and the challenges we face. We have learned a lot in this forum and we've learned that there's a lot more to learn. There've been some fantastic presentations. I think when we consider what action is most urgently needed for transformative change, there are three points. I think we need a realistic assessment by the private and government sectors on the challenges we are facing. Secondly, the assessment will be gradual as we learn more and more and more technical information and as more new technology comes to light, which can help us to learn even more. Thirdly, we need a recognition that the problem is global and not just a problem in the wealthy countries. So what will change actually require? Well, firstly, it needs a lot of imagination. We really have to reimagine the problem and the solution. It's said that when Henry Ford was asked, if he had asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses and not motor cars because they didn't exist then. So you look at companies that are looking at the challenges we face with imagination. We heard today from somebody at our booth about uh, the problem of toothpaste in plastic tubes. And they've invented a little pill that you can take and brush your teeth with this pill instead of using toothpaste from a plastic bottle. There are a lot of companies that are involved in making alternatives to plastic bottles, such as Nopla, using a material for packaging that's made from seafood and plants that will disappear naturally. Secondly, we have to have the ability to learn from others and from new technologies. Thirdly, we have to enhance our ability to use new technologies such as artificial intelligence. Fourthly, we need to look at better use of existing technologies using data analysis. For example, rainfall patterns are changing and I don't know if you can hear, but where I am here in Mbale, in eastern Uganda, it is raining heavily. The rainfall patterns have changed, the planting season and the harvesting season have moved. So we need to learn how we can use this data about when the new patterns are to change the manner in which we operate. 
And finally, in this section, we need to get early involvement of women and mothers so that education starts early. In my country, Uganda, we have the youngest population in the world with more than 30% between the age of 10 and 24 and 78% under the age of 30. Now, if we look at what I think the future should look like, we need a future that is food secure. And to do this, I believe we need to do production through sustainable resources in the Maori communities in New Zealand. There's a custom called Rahui, which means that certain resources are restricted, such as rivers, forests, and fisheries, in order to allow ecosystems to recover and out of respect for other living beings. This is the sort of ethic we desperately need to learn and employ. And finally, what the future should look like, we should be looking at zero carbon emissions. And here, as a small company in Uganda, we're working towards that. We're planting 10,000 trees in this part of Bugisu, and we're looking at getting more, more partners to join us in this program. Why can't we expand this to many more trees that will help preserve the ecosystem? We're also looking at cutting the use of pesticides and fertilizers and using either solar power or hydro so that we have respect for the environment in which we live. We use it sustainably and we work towards zero carbon emissions. Once again, I'd like to thank the GLF for inviting us onto this forum. We've learned a lot. It's been a great pleasure. And on behalf of the farmers of Bugisu and I, we, and the rest of the team at Carico around the world, we thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mwambu. What wise words, the need for new technologies and changes that are happening, the 10,000 plus trees getting planted and the communities, this is just amazing. I'd like to move on very swiftly to Melina Sakiyama, who is a youth voice and also part of the, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Melina, welcome. Would like to hear from you, your, you know, your, your youth voice, the lens that you're seeing the world in. And as we're talking about transformation, where do you see the change? Where is the agency? And also, where do you see um, the future? What does the future look like for you? Thank you so much, Musanda. Um, thank you so much for the GLF. It's been a pleasure to be part of this. And, and I have to say like all the, the young people from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network has been engaging with this forum as well. And I, I think um, it's a very big question. And it's one that um, the people from my community have been thinking a lot about that. Um, it's been more than two years already that the network has started a series of consultations among young people to try to think and envision what kind of future they would want to live on, what kind of priorities they would want. And like some very concrete ideas emerged from this consultation exercise. And it's very clear that for young people, what we need is true transformation, right? Like young people are envisioning a future where they can live in harmony with nature, but they can live in a peaceful, equitably manner. Okay, I think like more than ever, young people um, from the, my generation and the younger ones, they were born in a world that was already globalized in many in, in many places, and um, people understand diversity probably in, in a more deeper sense, they accept diversity much more. So they they wanna be living, you know, without hurting anybody else, without hurting any other species. They 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 just wanna pursue this this idea of like people and nature like in equity, right? And in that sense, like um our consultation exercise went also through the complexities and, and the depth of the ecological crisis that we are living and what are the challenges then for us to achieve that vision of future. And the reality is that we, we cannot live anymore like um, with sort of like building pretty facades or illusions or like, you know, creating excuses to our societies. The reality is that the way we produce, the way we extract, the way we consume, the way we trade the goods and the things, the way we dispose of it, it's not done like in a sustainable matter. It's done in a quite destructive form for the environment, not sustainably at all. And also like 
not equitably, right? So both the, 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 the benefits coming from all the wealth of nature and biodiversity and the negative impacts that come with its exploitation is being distributed in, the, in this world unequitably. So um, for young people, this is absolutely like um, a priority to be tackled. So we cannot talk about like, okay, conserving nature or conserving biodiversity without thinking about addressing those issues, without thinking about the rights um, of the people, without thinking about the empowerment of the people they are living in, in, in the lands and in, in nature. So it's, it's like a really sort of like um, young people are understanding the challenge as a holistic one, you know, and we understand that everybody has a role. We understand that like the powers are unequitably distributed also. So people and different stakeholder groups, different institutions, according to their powers and their privileges will have different responsibilities and different roles. But the reality for everybody is that we need to face this, like, frankly, you know, we we can't just like, you know, live in a world that is like greenwashed, you know, or that like we are like looking to all sorts of different types of solutions, but without addressing the real causes, without addressing the indirect drivers of biodiversity loss, we are not going to reach anywhere, right? So I think... This has come very, very strongly from the community and also the need to address both like social like justice and environmental justice as one, because if like we continue to sort of like only thinking in like climate objectives or like um, social objectives or biodiversity objectives separately, like we are not gonna address it because all those crises and all those prob problems are linked together and I think like in the end like it is I mean I I understand and I understand that everybody wants a positive message I understand that we are feeling a bit depressed <laughs> with the situation that is happening in the world with the pandemic mm -hmm. and with all the crisis and and like the negative um, impacts that we're feeling from already like a fragile and like collapsing sort of like ecological system Right. But the reality is that we have a lot of work to do and that we have a lot of responsibility for it. And we can't anymore keep hiding ourselves behind just like short term, shallow solutions when the problems that we are faced are so deep rooted, you know, and it's it's not like there are historical problems. There are like cultural issues. We need to think, rethink our principles. Because so far, like what we have seen as, as younger people that are a bit at the margin of the system is that we're still thinking in terms of profit, in terms of material gain, mm -hmm. but like our generation don't respond anymore just to that, right? Right. We don't work, we don't do our jobs or like, you know, our material, I mean, our pursuits in life is not just related to material gains anymore, right? So our relationship with life and our relationship with the environment is changing. And a lot of people are seeing that, that we are sort of like recovering parts of the relationship that indigenous peoples and local communities, for instance, have throughout so many so so many centuries right so i think maybe this is also a pathway and i mm -hmm. see like from my community that a lot of people are rethinking their relationship with nature a lot of people are being much more critical regarding short-term quick fixes sort of solutions mm -hmm. and they want real commitment from decision makers they want real commitment and real braveness you know because what we have to do it's like difficult and it will require shaking up the power structures it will require shaking up the systems right and for that we will have to be brave and we will have to be true to the principles that we're setting and the vision of future that we want so i think these are some of the words that are coming up from like the youth communities around the world so thank you so much thank you so much melina you actually really hit the nail on the head we have to be brave I mean, we found ourselves in this very complex situation. I'd like to now invite Rodrigo uh, Medain, who's a professor, a senior professor of ecology and biodiversity from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. 
Welcome. I'm so excited to really hear from a scholar and also from somebody who inspires students. How will you inspire your students into this transformation for change? And what are your thoughts and what you think is urgent at this juncture and how this future looks like? Musonda, thank you so much for that introduction. I have been so deeply moved by the insights of the previous speakers. And I really think that it is time that we, that we take action. Uh, thank you so much for, to C4 and to the GLF organizer for putting together this amazing forum. The prevalent conditions provide an amazing opportunity to rethink our relationship with the rest of the world. The pandemic is a clear and present sign that we are doing something wrong. And it is also a gateway to change our lives for the better. Let's stop looking for the culprit. It is easy enough to find the culprit if we stand in front of a mirror. It is us, all humans in the world. We brought this upon us. The only way to get COVID from another is from another human being. Despite what some scientists say, including some who are in this panel, who have said that if a bat flies by you, you are exposed to the virus, which is not true at all. Humans and bats have coexisted since we became humans 250,000 years ago when we were living in caves. Today, we continue to coexist with bats in rural and urban conditions, and that is not bringing COVID to our lives at all. On the contrary, we need bats to protect our crops by eating tons of insect pests. We need them to eat millions of mosquitoes, to disperse millions of seeds, and to pollinate hundreds of ecologically and economically important plants. And blaming them and bashing them does nothing other than to scare people and, yes, help line the pockets of those crying wolves. Today, I want to share only four of the many lessons that I have learned over the past eight months that will likely accompany us for the rest of our lives. Number one, the environment is the most important asset that we have. The best defense against the next pandemic is not bashing bats, but protecting the environment. The dilution effect shows that when humans disturb pristine ecosystems, certain opportunistic species and their pathogens freed from their predators and competitors become super abundant and thus the conditions for a new outbreak are promoted. At least 80% of the zoonotic diseases respond to the dilution effect. In pristine environments, all plants and animals and their pathogens are there, but they're diluted. Number two, we must make bushmeat consumption sustainable, safe, healthy, and respectful of animals and humans. Over 1 billion people depend on bushmeat for their protein intake today. It is up to us, scientists and decision makers, to make this sustainable. Bushmeat consumption is here to stay, my friends, but it must be properly regulated and the consumed species must be protected from overharvesting and from extinction. Wet markets, as currently understood, do not work well for humans or wildlife. These markets must be drastically transformed to secure humane and sustainable harvesting, safe and healthy transport and trade, and healthy consumption. Number three, we need to reduce the consumption of meat of domestic animals and improve production practices and policies. Meat consumption has transformed the face of the earth, and today only 4% of the animal biomass in the world is represented by wildlife. Our domestic animals, cattle, chicken, pigs, and us dominate the landscape, and we need to reverse this trend. In a related issue, the health of the animals that we consume must be secured and their animal rights upheld. Avian influenza is an example of what can happen if we do not resolve this issue. In the health of the animals we consume, rights our own health. And number four, into the future, food security, biodiversity conservation, and climate change mitigation will dominate our landscape. Mm -hmm. It is best 
that all world leaders come to grasp with this fact and act now to ensure that the best science-based policy on biodiversity conservation, food security, and climate change is implemented. The future of the world rides on this action. We all have something to do, and if we are not part of the solution, I'm sorry, my friends, but then we are part of the problem. I invite you all to ponder all of the great information that we have absorbed over the course of this fantastic forum and incorporate the lessons that we have learned into our everyday lives. Our future depends on it. Thank you very much. Gracias, Rodrigo. This is really amazing because we just have to look into the mirror and to see that we are also part of the problem. You are right. And we are also part of that solution for this future to be bright and amazing and wonderful. At this juncture, I would like to now invite um, Yvonne Sawyer, who is the mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone. Yvonne, welcome. You presented an amazing conversation not so long ago, about two weeks ago, talking about your city as a mayor of that city, the green city, Freetown, the green town. I was just so impressed and I was really inspired by how even on the African continent, and I live in Nairobi, that is a green city. Where do you see that transformation happening? And if you were to inspire other cities, not just in Africa, but anywhere else in the world, and they're greening in their transformation, how would you define that future to them? Thank you very much. And as others have said, it's been a real, it's a real pleasure to be on this um, in this forum, and I've really also learned a lot from um, previous speakers, very, very inspiring indeed. Um, and I think where what I would say is, is really picking up on the previous speaker about the importance of political leadership now as we face um, the need, urgent need, um, for restoring biodiversity, particularly within the context of climate change mitigation. Uh, and it's Freetown, the tree town, um, a commitment to plant a million trees. And the, the, the vision here is an appreciation that my city, like many other cities uh, in the global south, and indeed around the world generally, um, is, is experiencing an increase uh, in population size as rural urban migration continues to in, uh, increase. Um, the projections from the UN is that we will have 75% of the world living in cities by 2050. That pressure is a pressure on all the space. And in our case in particular in Freetown, we are, our, our geography makes us land constrained. We've got a mountainous front um, and then we've, we've got the sea, the Atlantic and the plain and the city sort of rests between the ocean and the mountains. And what has happened in the last 25 years, but particularly really, really dramatically in the last 10 years has been rapid deforestation of those hills resulting in landslides, um, in flooding, in water shortages, and of course, everything that comes along with the loss of biodiversity. And what we've sought to do has been to take a lead as a city. And when I say take a lead, I was listening to speakers before talking about the people, the indigenous people um, and that connection with nature. You could have, as we do in our city, people who've come from rural areas who are accustomed to being around trees, around nature, but in a city context, um, don't have the wherewithal to recreate that. What we're seeking to do is bring back a forest to Freetown. Freetown, the tree town, is our plan to plant a million trees over a two year period. We have, I'm pleased to say, um, almost, I'm looking at my watch, <laughs> we have almost completed the planting of 450,000 trees. Um, over the last four weeks. Um, wow. This was this been planned. This has been planned for, for eight months. Um, and, it, and it requires finances. And Jeff is on the call. And Jeff and World Bank have been a big source of that. But so have ordinary Freetonians. So have people in the diaspora. So have the corporate sector. And um, we've really seen Freetonians coming together um, to, to make this happen. For us, it's not just about planting trees. And this is so important as we talk about biodiversity because tree planting can be a bit of a trendy thing to do. 
what really matters is that the trees are grown, that they remain there beyond the planting exercise, beyond the cameras. And in order for us to achieve that, this piece around community has been fundamental. It's been giving, we've been giving our residents the opportunity to be tree stewards themselves, um, to engage as individuals in planting in their backyards, in, their, in, in school compounds. But we've also given communities, people living in informal settlements, we've also given them the opportunity to plant on the hillsides um, as community. With that planting uh, and the stewardship comes the basis for the monitoring of the plants, monitoring of the trees. We've developed, we're using technology. We have a tree tracker app, which um, literally has uploaded up on it every single one of the trees that we've planted or that have been planted. It has the GPS codes, it has photographs, um, and those will be updated by the community people themselves, by residents themselves, but also by community-based organizations who are serving as our growers, our monitors, who monitor the trees every month. Um, and, and so what we've done in Freetown, uh, hopefully kind of ties in, I think, with some of what the other speakers were talking about. Um, that appreciation of the role of people in the solution, of our communities in the solution, the appreciation of nature-based solutions as we struggle with, with urbanization um, and the possibility of actually creating pockets of nature, even within an urban setting. So whether it's in your backyard, it's in a school, it's in a cemetery, it's in an office or in front of an office, creating these oases within the urban setting, which allows even within the context of urbanization for us still to hold true to the importance of restoring our biodiversity and of doing so through a very simple nature-based solution of planting trees. The selection of species is very important. This is done with technical experts to make sure we're getting the right trees for the right places um, and also bringing in the economic value for communities, ensuring that the economic trees among them and allowing the, 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 the community people to actually select the trees. Um, and I think the, the and a final point which I'd like to make is that it, it's what uh, uh, the young activist, the youth voice uh, the speaker, Melina, it's what she mentioned. Um, and that's dealing with the underlying drivers that are leading to the loss of biodiversity, recognizing that 28% of emissions in Freetown come from charcoal and 82% of energy that's used for cooking is charcoal. And what is charcoal? It's the very trees that we're trying to grow. So making sure that you have integrated solutions where at the same time we're planting trees, we are also working on alternative fuel uh, um, opportunities, market, making marketing opportunities available and, and promoting those. A holistic, a holistic solution, solutions are required for transformation. That's what we're doing with Freetown, the tree town, and that's what we're doing with Transform Freetown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Soria. What an exciting dynamic. There you are. You have an app for everybody to be held accountable and making sure that the tree survives. This is just amazing and a brilliant way to monitor and for people not to really, you know, be laxed in their way and just think, let's just put the tree over there. This is just amazing and such an inspiration, not just for Africa, I think for many other cities around the world. I hope to visit Freetown one day. I have so many friends from Sierra Leone. Um, thank you so much for your intervention. This next speaker is an amazing person who's leading an incredible alliance called the Echo Health Alliance. P Peter Dazak is going to be telling us about this alliance. And Peter, I'm just very curious how within the context of this alliance and also the context of the, the transformational dynamic that we've been talking about and One Health in particular, where do you see the urgency and also, how do you see the future, particularly from the context of your alliance? Oh, thanks very much. And uh, what a great pleasure to be here. Look, I, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and that's the urgency. And this pandemic is just one in a whole string of pandemics that have been 
um, happening faster and faster on our planet. It's a symptom of something fundamentally wrong with our relationship with nature, for sure. And the planet is sick, and it's making us sick. And the cause of that sickness is our actions on this planet. And we all know this. Um, but why, why do we sit here and wait? I mean, our current strategy to deal with pandemics is to wait for them to emerge, hope we can catch them as quickly as possible, and then control them and contain them. And if they escape and go global, then we rely on vaccines and, and science to help technology our way out of this. And, and there's something fundamentally wrong with that approach. First of all, it reacts to a problem instead of tries to prevent it. And it goes against what we know we should be doing. Secondly, it's just not working. We're sat here right now, many of us in lockdown, many of us here in the US going into worse situation over the next few months waiting for a vaccine, waiting for a cure. This, this pandemic has terrible impacts in, on those who are already um, treated badly by uh, many countries and, and society. Um, and it's just not sustainable. So what, what are the solutions to this? And the solutions are, first of all, understanding where pandemics come from. And yes, COVID-19 is caused by a virus that originated in wildlife, without a doubt. This is a bat origin virus. But that means we don't say, well, we've got to get rid of bats. How ridiculous. No, we want to find out why it emerged. It emerged because of unsustainable land use change in parts of Southeast Asia around the world that drive people into closer contact in, with wildlife in the very worst way um, for us to catch viruses through an unsustainable and industrialized wildlife trade. So, you know, I've got behind me um, the banner from IPBES. The, um, uh, today we, we uh, produced a report on pandemics and biodiversity. And we tried to show what science is telling us about what we can do to make a sustainable solution, a transformative change to dig our way out of this pandemic era that we've caused ourselves to be in. And what we need are um, a better understanding of the drivers, land use change, the wildlife trade. We need to look at why people do these things. What are the consumption patterns that drive it? And yes, we need to look in the mirror. Those consumption patterns are driven by all of us. Um, you know, as, as people in the richer countries around the world buy a winter jacket and get a nice fur trim, look at where that fur comes from. It might come out of a farm that raises in an unsustainable way um, wildlife Farming wildlife in China in, in 2016 uh, employed 14 million people and was worth $77 billion. This is an industrialized um, operation and it's known to produce pandemics. Um, the US imports the second highest number of wildlife on the planet, mainly for um, the pet trade and for food. And that's been known to produce pandemic risk. Why aren't we taking this more seriously? So we've been talking in, in the pandemics report about ways we can deal with this better. And yes, we need to work together as countries, um, the richer and those in, in the more biodiverse regions that are less resource rich to deal with the same problem because viruses um, don't check their passports at border. They just move straight through. They don't check how wealthy you are before they infect you. Um, and people of all um, uh, distribution of wealth die from COVID-19. Even with the underlying drivers, will probably cost between 40 and $50 billion. That's two orders of magnitude return on investment, $100 return for every dollar invested. What an incredible optimistic future we have if we actually decide to do this. So we need to come together, the virologists around the world, the conservationists, the people working on global environmental change, all of us have a role to play. We personally can reduce our own um, unsustainable consumption to, and think about the benefits. We will make ourselves healthier by reducing pandemic risk. We will conserve biodiversity. We will reduce climate change and move to a planet that is healthy again. And when the planet's healthy, we will be healthy. So I'm really looking forward to the future and helping in everywhere we can to do that. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much for those wise words. I mean, viruses do not have passports and they cross as we have seen, and neither do they even know or do they even care about our social class and status. We have to do something about it. And thank you very much for actually highlighting the launch today of the IPBES report on pandemics and biodiversity. That's absolutely amazing. I'd like to now move to a video message that's coming from Benki Pianko, who is an Ashaninka community leader from the Amazonia state of Aka. So we're going to have a video now, and if it can go live, please. Primeiramente, o silêncio. O silêncio na vida. Um pouquinho de silêncio na vida para lembrar que existe vida é muito importante para lembrar de tudo que nós vivemos. Quando você para um pouco para pensar o tamanho desse planeta e a diversidade que esse planeta tem e a diversidade de vida que faz vida e que gera vida nesse planeta. É muito importante um pouquinho desse silêncio humano e desse abraço que todo esse universo possa abraçar a humanidade. Quero aqui mandar uma mensagem, não só para um povo, ou uma nação, ou um país, mas que para o mundo inteiro, quero chamar a atenção, dizendo, vamos salvar a terra como a si próprio. Vamos salvar o mundo começando de nós, em primeiro lugar. Vamos abraçar essa causa junto, porque é só nós unidos. Quero chamar todos os líderes espirituais, todos os cientistas do mundo, todos os grandes sábios da terra e todos os grandes mestres do universo, para ajudar a dar a oportunidade de um novo ensinamento para as crianças, para os jovens, para os adolescentes, que mude seus pensamentos para uma nova retomada de um equilíbrio mundial, de um, de um equilíbrio humanitário. Quero deixar dizendo, vamos capacitar jovens que traga espírito na sua mente, traga amor, compaixão, sentimento, traga verdade e não engane a si próprio. Porque nós buscamos a encontrar, a se encontrar com essas forças universais que está ligada à incorporação de um ser que representa a humanidade. Vamos junto trabalhar aqui, eu no meio dessa floresta, escutando os pássaros cantando, a floresta se balançando, o ser vivo vibrando sobre mim. Quero aqui fazer um canto, chamando a atenção de todos, porque é com alegria que eu curo, é com alegria que me faz ser forte, é com alegria que mostra que somos capazes de viver muito mais, muito mais. Nada me faz ficar triste, porque eu sou alegre até no final da minha morte. Quero ser esse, feliz sempre, mostrando que o que passei já foi passado, deixei a lembrança para muitos que vão ficar lembrando do que fiz. E essa mensagem leva sempre para todos que estão ainda vendo que somos capazes de mudar o mundo, junto, unido, em um só pensamento. Quero aqui fazer um canto como um abraço fraterno de uma liderança que hoje se planeja para plantar 10 milhões de árvores e conto com você para estar junto, sempre comigo. Esse canto chama Tanangro, o pássaro que veio lá do alto e pousou no braço de Tassorentes e disse, sou um mensageiro da terra. O tanangro, 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 hey! O tanangro, 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 hey! Aí tem cataco, aí tem cataco, o tanangro, 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 ro, 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 hey! Yanango, 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 ra 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 ra, Yanango, ra ra ra, he.
Beautiful chant, Tanangro. We have to unite as humanity in the spirit of humanity. It's been such a joy moderating this session and speaking and listening to the voices and just the conversations with everyone out there. What an amazing moment for humanity, the transformation that we need. It was great to listen to the global perspective, but at the very beginning, we had Elizabeth Morema, who is the Executive Secretary of the CBD, really talking about the urgency and also the power we have as humans to transform. And congratulations on the Nagoya Protocol, which Carlos Manuel also touched on and really talked about this 30 years of GEF. They're going to be having a birthday very soon. But both Christian and Carla really touched on the, the urgency and the, the need for the science and policy linkages and also in the, the funding mechanisms that are involved in that they really do take into account all these different elements and importance of engagement and how we're all engaged. But what even more excited me the most was really listening to different individuals, people that are like you and I living in their different constituencies, being Mwembu from Mount Elgon or the mayor of Freetown, Yvonne, Melina, Youth Voices, or the Eagle professor inspiring his students and Peter talking with an alliance and really being engaged in all these different conversations. I think what's come out of this is just the urgency for action and how we need to inspire and transform the lives of the young people as Benki has said in that, how do we bring in a new spirit, a new energy to teach the young, the adolescents, the youth, our babies, to make them realize that they're also part of this planet, but we give them new knowledge and better knowledge and better change for us to be able to shift. So without further ado, I'd like to now uh, pass on um, the baton over to Robert Nassi, who's going to do the final and closing remarks for this GLF. I'm afraid we've had no time for questions, but thank you ever very much for those questions that you sent out to us. Over to you, Robbie. Yes. Thank you, Musanda. And uh, <clears throat> I apologize because it's uh, one o'clock in the morning here in Bogor and, and normally uh, at this time, I'm already in bed for a long time, but uh, this is the time that uh, it's always a pleasure for me in a sense and a, a bit of a, um, also a bit sad uh, closing the, the Global Landscape Forum. And, and for our conference this time, we, we, we had about 5,000 uh, participants from 119 countries. Uh, we had also 50 sessions with 261 speakers. And if you miss a session, if you want to watch again, uh, the platform will be open for another two weeks. Uh, we published 15 white paper. There were more than 550 people on average per session and some up to 1,300. We had 30,000 people using online, 30 million reach on social media and trending on Twitter. We have exchanged 16,000 messages among participants. And, and about 300 participants have created a WhatsApp group to stay connected post the conference. We also had 90 students and new professors from more than 40 countries who joined a month, one month learning journey in preparation to the conference to create a community and connect despite the challenge, this community will continue to exist and engage. We also need a special thanks to our 50 of young volunteer and social media ambassador that have supported GLF for the past few weeks. And we have a 25th, uh, 25 youth delegation who joined the conference to contribute to the Global Landscape Forum Biodiversity Policy Brief, which will inform the global biodiversity agenda and action point for addressing the biodiversity crisis. Now, I'm not going to try to summarize what was said in the conference, but I, I, I have a few, a few notes that I've been taking and uh, I'm trying to, to, to make it short, and, but uh, I think it's important. Well, we are clearly on a one, one of a time moment. I mean, a sort of, we have created the condition uh, for total society collapse, uh, but contrary to the previous society collapse, like the Roman or the Maya, we know enough what we should do to avoid this collapse. So we are already at sort of a particular time. And, and we have the sort of the infernal couple of biodiversity loss and climate change uh, that are reinforcing each other, uh, fueled by inequalities. And if we do not solve these problems, this is an existential question. 
uh, we are going to have difficult times and we are going to have probably a global society collapse. Not that the murderers will bother because we disappear, but we, it will be very annoying for us. I mean, so we must act and don't get fooled. I mean, a sort of technology alone will not solve us. I mean, a sort of Star Trek uh, hypothesis is not going to work. Uh, technology can help us, but more than that, we need to change very strongly our development model and our basic paradigms. There is no such thing as indefinite sustainable growth. So we must, looking about the biodiversity, conserve uh, our remaining biodiversity. And, and when you say conserve the biodiversity, very often people think about conserving the tigers or, or, or the orangutan or the whales. And then there are good reasons to conserve these all these emblematic animals. They are beautiful. Uh, the world will be a much sadder place without them. And, and like for the West, they represent $1 trillion on carbon stocks at the price of carbon tons. Uh, but not only the emblematic species, I mean, it's all piece of biodiversity matters, including the trees in your backyard, uh, the bush that grows in the middle of the road. We must conserve the biodiversity that is left. At the meantime, while conserving this biodiversity, we will expect to contain and maintain our standard of living, or at least a certain standard of living, a decent standard of living. And for that, we need to produce goods and services. So that means that we need to mainstream biodiversity in our productive sector. Uh, and, and that's something that is very important. Uh, and that's something that we can do, and we can do it with benefits. And, and of course, I mean, some sectors are directly impacted by biodiversity. I mean, so agriculture is living on borrowed time from biodiversity for pollination, for uh, pest uh, uh, <coughs> control, for growth. Uh, and other sectors may believe that they are immune to biodiversity loss, like the fossil fuel. But if it's the case, they are fooling themselves because without biodiversity, they will not survive either. And then after conserving what we need, what is left after mainstreaming biodiversity in our production sector, we need to restore what has been degraded. And, and we need to make restoration as economic enterprise that create jobs, services, and, and, and livelihood on top of restoring biodiversity in services. And if you invest $1 in the restoration, empirical data shows that you have a return of seven to $10 so the question is why we are not doing it. And that's why it's very important to, to note uh, the visionary view, the visionary action of the UN and declaring the UN decade on restoration from 2021 to 2030. It will be the right moment to do that. Now, critics will tell you, well, but to do that, we need a lot of money and costing things. It's not possible. Well, that's a lousy, lousy argument, if, if any, an argument. Let's let's look at some numbers. I mean, sort of, we spend nearly about five hundred billion dollars on subsidies for fossil fuel, six hundred billion dollars on subsidy for agriculture. Uh, we spend about one thousand three hundred billion dollars on military expenditure, and if you look at the current uh, pandemic, you can see that. Spending $1,300 billion in military expenditure did, didn't help us to win the war against COVID. So military zero, COVID one. And when we bail out the banks in 2008, I mean, a sort of the direct amount was around $1, billion, $1, one trillion, but the actual cost is estimated at $16 trillion. So we have some money. Where do we invest is different. Uh, if we wanted to invest in conserving biodiversity, we think about $80 billion a year should do the, more, the math. <clears throat> and in terms of restoring uh, the degraded land, between 40 to $50 billion a year should be enough. Also. So if you look at what we have spent in subsidies, uh, in bailing out the banks and in building weapons of mass destruction, we could as well have saved the biodiversity of the world several times and, and restore our land a couple of times too. So. It's really something where we all need to sit uh, around the table, uh, indigenous people, local communities, private sector, public sector, civil society. Uh, uh, because the one that will not sit on the table, they will quickly end up on the menu. 
And we need to sit on the table. We have enough knowledge of what should be done. We have enough money if we want to invest the money uh, on these topics. And, and then we know that there is a likely return on this investment on the medium to long term that will dwarf any money that we spend now. So the question is, is why we are not doing it? Uh, I think we can do it. And I think that uh, let's do it. And that's where a platform like the Global Landscape Forum is very important because that's a place where you bring all the people around the table so that we can set up our own menu in terms of conserving biodiversity, mitigating climate change, uh, reducing inequalities. And, and today we also launched the Global Landscape, the GLFX platform, offering everyone an opportunity to connect globally and act locally. And uh, you can engage uh, an exclusive networking and dialogue with leading experts on restoration. And if you want to drive local action, you can also, I invite, I invite you to join a GLF chapter on apply to start your own today. We also announced six restoration stewards from six ecosystem and, and six partner organizations, including C4Aircraft will mentor them on their journey to restore the landscape while inspiring others to do the same. And as we said, I mean, it's sort of the Global Landscape Forum is your uh, platform. There is a commitment to connect, share, learn and act. And we hope you can join us and we are closing this conference, but we are starting a call for action and we need to pursue and we need to make sure that we get traction with the others that we are not attending in terms of solving the problem of biodiversity crisis, the climate change and inequalities. And I would like to finish by thanking uh, the GLF staff. We did a fantastic job as usual. We'd like to thank our donors, our sponsor, and you all participants, all the people that watch online uh, and that joined that for us. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and looking forward to see you in the next GLF. And in the meantime, biodiversity matters, climate change matters, and inequality matters. Thank you very much.